uh, I always tell students, like, and now you can't unsee this stuff. Hmm. Like, you're forever yeah, going to yeah. have to acknowledge this, right? Like, you, once you see it, you can't unsee it. We can look at, right, we can look at workers, but really never truly acknowledge what, what it means for them to be doing that work for us. Because, like, we shouldn't get that mixed up either. Like, it is work for us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, making this campus beautiful. Uh, the people who clean my office literally empty out my trash bins once a week, right? People who clean dorms, um, our restrooms on campus. They, they are literally allowing us to do the work that we do. Greetings, friends, and welcome to Our World Openly, with me, your host, Antony Kalkowski. Today, I have an exciting guest for you, Professor Salvador Zarate. Zarate is a cultural anthropologist who studies Latinx migrant labor and who studies ecology in Southern California. He received his PhD in Ethnic Studies from the University of California, San Diego, and is currently an Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Irvine. His work has appeared in Sapiens, Kalfu, a journal of comparative and relational ethnic studies, Feminist Formations, Anthropology and Humanism, and the American Studies Journal. He grew up working as a residential gardener and fire mitigation worker for his father's company in Orange County, California. Me and Sal know each other from a university class on anthropology of labor. And in this conversation, we talk about the dimensions of labor within our society, including students as workers, reproductive and productive labor, racialized and gendered labor within capitalism, the labor of mothers and fathers, the nuclear household, neo-colonialism, Latinx farm workers, domestic workers, and witches, robots, and capitalism. Without further ado, here is Professor Zarate. We were going to be talking about uh, the dimensions of labor uh, and how it interacts with things such as race and gender. And uh, I just want to kind of showcase how I uh, met Sal here. Um, I'm basically a student at the University of California, Irvine. And uh, so he has this amazing labor class. And um, in it, we got to traverse, uh, you know, the labor dimensions of autom automated robots, as well as witches, as well as domestic laborers and, um, you know, essential workers and uh, fire mitigation workers. And um, the class has been just so ex inspiring to me. And I was really pulled into taking a class in the first place with you, because um, as I mentioned to you before, the, uh, you know, kind of growing up in the Bay Area um, is one of the areas in the Bay Area where I grew up, there was a lot of uh, Latinx uh, construction laborers, as well as Latinx um, laborers that were doing all of the kind of urban, uh, metropolitan and suburban um, kind of maintenance, right? So cleaning the streets, uh, you know, fixing any kind of problems with, let's say, uh, the electricity cabling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was always so fascinated as, you know, like, wh why, is, why is there this kind of, uh, you know, racial divide uh, between the wealthy white and also Asian immigrants who lived in that neighborhood and uh, the laborers who maintain that, um, who were, you know, Latino. And... Um, the other thing that I noticed, you know, going to Las Vegas was also that, you know, a lot of the people in kind of the uh, gambling establishments, um, the gamblers were also uh, Latinx 
rather than any other mm -hmm. kind of ethnicity. And that also was really interesting to me. And so and I had this need to really figure out why am I seeing these kinds of phenomena play out? Uh, and how do I put words and theories into understanding this aspect of my daily reality? And so that's why I, 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 I took Sal's class and that's how you know, we got to know each other. And so you know, me giving this kind of student story perspective, I'd love Sal, if you could give us a uh, perspective on kind of how you got into your research and how you got into uh, generally your specialization of labor um, and also any kind of struggles you might have experienced throughout uh, your journey in academia. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Thank you so much for, for the kind of words. Anthony, it's been really, I think, great teaching the class with all of you. I think the, the students make a class, right? And I think the class culture in ours has been really great. Um, but I kind of want to uh, first take a step back, which is not everyone uh, notices those workers. Right. I think it's kind of the premise of my course, right? And uh, in a lot of ways, the premise of my research that um, there are service workers, right? For example, construction workers or, or um, service and industry workers, right? Um, people like construction workers, people like gardeners here on campus, uh, janitorial services, right? And I often will challenge students to think about when the last time they actually thought about those workers. And, and I think maybe I frame it to you all more directly as, when was the last time you saw one, <laughs> right? And, and I, I say that in order to drive the point home that, and I think I might have said this to you all, but um, you might see them, but you're not actually seeing them, mm -hmm. right? Uh, to see them and to acknowledge them are two separate things. So you might see a gardener working around campus but not really acknowledge it, right? Really not, not acknowledging them. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is that case? Like, why am I trained to like see, but also like look past, right? Or to not really be able to, to confront, right? So you know, one of the things we do in our, in, in, in our class is to think about that deeply. Why is it that in our society, we can look at, right? We can look at workers, but really never truly acknowledge what what it means for them to be doing that work for us because like we shouldn't get that mixed up either like it is work for us right mm -hmm. like making this campus beautiful uh the people who clean my office literally empty out my trash bins once a week right people who clean dorms um our restrooms on campus Th they are literally allowing us to do the work that we do mm -hmm. right so i think um I, I think it's powerful, and, and I, I do think that maybe at one point um, in, in my course, uh, I always tell students, like, and now you can't unsee this stuff. Hmm. Like, you're forever yeah, going to yeah. have to acknowledge this, right? Like, you, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And, and I, I don't mean it as, like, a thing that you see once, but as, like, a kind of, a, a kind of, um, how could we put it, like, a, uh, a kind of lens, right, by which to view the world where you actually think deeply about the amount of labor that goes into sustaining a life in which you never have to think about taking out the trash in your office, right? You never have to think about uh, cleaning the restrooms on our campus, right? Like, why don't we, right? So it's, it's an ability to see and acknowledge that that I think is empowering can actually create the first steps towards a kind of you know if we might say something like a student worker solidarity or or at least for the most part acknowledging that they're part of our world right mm -hmm. yeah um so i guess that's kind of like a a, a more general way to introduce myself <laughs> right my research yeah yeah but um you know, I, I think um, what brings me here, right, as the question you actually asked me before <laughs> I decided to talk about this, but, you know, I feel like it's germane, but um, I, I've, I know I've shared with you all that I grew up in Orange County, right? Mm -hmm. like I grew up here. Um, 
I grew up working uh, gardening labor with my dad, right? Resident as a residential gardener uh, in and around the very neighborhoods of, of UC Irvine, right? So as an undergrad, um, I would often, and I share this story a lot because I think it's really important, right? Like I would drive to campus. I had a pickup truck at the time. I would drive a campus in my pickup truck with like some equipment, um, like my own equipment that my dad's workers would need, but I would go to course in, courses in Crystal Cove. I think it's still called that, right? Crystal Cove Auditorium. Like at not nine in the morning or something, it was a humanities core series. Um, and I remember one particular week, now I'm just going full blown story and I apologize for that. <laughs> no, but I remember perfect. one particular week we were reading Oscar Zeta Costa's A Revolt of the Cockroach People. It's like this really kind of like canonical Chicano text. Um, but it's super problematic, but still like it's a canonical text. Um, and I just remember reading that and going to listen to lecture and I don't remember who the professor was anymore. This would have been literally 2000s. Um, I wish I could remember, but uh, the listeners may not know the content of the, of the novel or the, the book, but this might be a good opportunity for them to actually read it. But, so I remember uh, engaging that text, kind of a semin seminal, right, Chicano, early Chicano uh, studies text, and then driving, right, lecture ends, getting in my pickup truck, driving to meet my dad just a couple blocks from campus, right? I think it was like on Jeffrey or something to, um, to, to then tag along with his crew and help them, right? Uh, do the kind of landscaping. Cause he did kind of larger, he didn't do simple maintenance, which usually can be one or two people who will, you know, complete it. He did kind of larger stuff as well. So he had a kind of a small gardening crew and I would just join them. And, um, that was, that's kind of like, formative right to to my research development my own personal development um i never had the ability to be like a student mm. you get what i'm saying like i mm. never had the ability just to be a student and i think about that and i you know part of me is still overwhelmingly like or powerfully jealous of my colleagues who could be, right? They would just go to school and they lived on campus and they would go to class and then they would go to I don't know, the food food hall or whatever they're called, canteens, I don't know. But um, and then I have that experience, right? And I didn't have that experience, but, uh, and, and it's not me just being salty, but like a part of it is, you know, because of it eventually, and I, I know I have shared this with the class, and I always put this on blast just because I think it's important, but I, I was academically disqualified right, as an undergraduate yeah. student. Um, and th there, that is a structural reason, right? There is a structural reason for that. And it's because I was working two jobs, right? Because mm -hmm. I couldn't get student loans, because all these things, um, actually being tired from working, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, Spoiler alert, I eventually get back into UC Irvine and now, right, whatever, I'm a professor here. So it kind of, you know, the loop closes, so to speak. But there's so many who that, that never happens for, right? They get kicked out and that's it, right? Um, and so that's kind of, um, I guess, by way of an introduction of who I am, but also what I do and why I care in terms of like teaching and research and you know, I see these things as like really um, integral to who I am as a person, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like, especially this point on kind of, you know, how the system deprived you of the experience and the benefits of just being a student, I feel like that's, that's such a powerful reality in almost any academia today. I know if you look at, you know, just like basic national statistics, like especially minority groups get, uh, you know, they drop out more than, you know, majority groups. And, you know, that's not by yeah, any yeah. kind of, uh, you know, meritocratic reason. It's just because they had to take on two jobs. Um, they had, you know, some of them have to take care of, you know, kids. Um, 
these kind of structural inequalities, they really shape the, the kind of formative and developmental experiences of society. And I think it's, it's, it's really kind of, I personally think it's, it's bullshit that a student has to take on any extra job. I mean, I, I think as, as you might have implied, I, as, or explicitly said in, in the classroom, like being a student is a, a, a job. It's a, it's a kind of career that you can fail at and you right. can, uh, you still have to, you know, go home and uh, spend all these hours studying and you have to go to a workplace, which is, you know, your classroom and taking on jobs uh, while you're a student, it, it does take away the ability to really develop as when you're in that stage and to really dive into the material. Though you could be learning other right, things yeah. along the line while, you know, doing a job. Yeah, right. And you could also be, you know, employed on campus and, and mm -hmm. things like that. So there's plenty of gray area uh, for sure. But like in terms of like the structural reasons why why students get pushed out, right? There's a whole host of everything from like legal um, uh, legal reasons, right? Things like documentation, um, and quite frankly, lack of resources on campus to then be able to support students uh, fully, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, I, I think it does change the conversation when we think about students performing work right that it is absolutely true that i mean it takes an inordinate amount of time and effort to do well right at a university um and so i i think it it really changes the conversation when we think about um what it would mean for students to actually be sustained on the campus meaningfully and not just students who have the kinds of social and economic capital to be able to do that, but for everyone to be able to do that, right? Like mm -hmm. that would be uh, quite quite a radical proposition for university to say that the students we take on are students that we're gonna definitely support fully, right? Um, and we see all the ramifications of this. We see it in terms of expanding student debt, right? Uh, universities becoming more and more austere Right, so the kind of the university as uh, you know becoming or already is, as many of my colleagues in critical university studies will tell you, like a neoliberal. Uh, uh, it's become more neoliberalized, right? Mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. more and more debt is given to students, or is, has to be uh, brunted by or taken on by students in order to make their education possible, right? When mm -hmm. We know, at least in California, we have the California Master Plan, which was supposed to make it so that everyone in California could get a, a, a practically a free education, right, at, at a top tier university like the University of California. And we now know that we're getting further and further away from that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a national it's a national issue, right? We see President Biden doing all these efforts to be able to provide a level of of um, of relief to students, right, or previous students who have taken on massive amounts of debt in order to make the so-called American dream possible for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that this also impacts black, brown, and other communities, the color indigenous communities, in or, you know, overwhelmingly and inordinately, um, um, they are the ones who are experiencing this yeah. most gravely, right? So. Yeah, students as workers, I think, is actually really, um, could be really a promising way to ensure that people can get the education they need. And of course, this is, you know, um, maybe not how we currently think about it, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, especially on this neoliberalization of, of you know, academia, I feel like uh, you know, you, there, there's been a ton of um, people, like you mentioned, in kind of critical um, studies uh, scholarship talking about this. Um, you know, another, another thing that you could, I, I feel you could point out is, is um, you know, academia is, is slowly becoming more and more, it, it's incorporating more and more aspects of like a capitalist business. 
So for example, you know, I, as a student, I get like tons of emails from the university about like, uh, you know, uh, hurry, buy now, 15% off these yeah. sweatshirts and mugs. And it's like this, and I get those emails, like, like three emails a day. It's just like constant marketing for me to, you know, put my money into, into um, you know, the, the university for, for profits. Um, but so I, I do, I, I would like to pivot and, and kind of then talk about, um, you know, the struggles and the realities of the uh, labor that maintains, you know, the students and everybody else chasing this American dream. And um, in, in this sense, I, I would ask if maybe it'd be helpful for you to, um, to explain to us, like, kind of the concepts of reproductive labor and the concepts of unfree versus free labor. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, when I talk about this in class, it's often in terms of um, what it takes for you as a student to be able to fulfill your duties as a student or worker, right? Um, and sometimes my students are both, right? They're working one or two jobs and, right, they're, they're going to classes. But um, actually, I'm going to mention there's someone on our campus named Teresa Neighbors who runs a really amazing center uh, called DIRA. It's a Diversity, Inclusion, and Racial Healing. And there's, I, I don't know what the A stands for. <laughs> I think there is an A. But um, this program gets students from Orange County, primarily their high school students, right? Sophomores, I think sophomores and juniors, some seniors. And they host um, a number of workshops and guest speakers every year. Uh, and, and so like, I, I usually will do the one on labor and gender for them. I'm actually on the board, right, of <laughs> this thing. But um, I, I think it's like such a, an opportunity because they're high schoolers and I often ask them, what does it take for you to go to school every morning, right? Because we, when you're a high schooler, like that's all you know, right? Like you've already been conditioned, right? Elementary, sometimes preschool, junior high, you get up, you go to school, you get up, you go to school. It's just, it's like your whole life, mm -hmm. right? And so they often say, well, you don't have to have breakfast or I have to take the bus for like 20 minutes or an hour. Or a whole host of other things. And then I always ask them, well, what else? What else? What else? Like, what else does it take, right? Mm -hmm. Until we finally, someone will uh, mention, um, or like, comes into view, or comes into the discussion. Well, I guess my mom sets my cereal out for me, or gets the milk out every morning for me and my dad, or whatever, right? Yeah. And then it's like that aha moment. That's what it takes. Like you are literally dependent on forms of labor that reproduce you every day as a student, as a high school student, right? Um, just like we get reproduced all the time here at the university by our custodians, you know, the, the kind of affective nourishment we get from the ecology and plants by our gardeners, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, when, when things are heavy around, like right now, finals week, students will go outside. Mm -hmm. Right, and you take solace in the environment. You take solace in beautifully, beautifully manicured gardens. Like that's all there for our consumption, right? To feel better and to get really stress or what have you. So for students to think of the, for students to have to acknowledge, even a place like the home, which is supposed to be outside of so-called relations of work, as a site of work becomes kind of like an uncomfortable moment for them right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they realize that yes their mom or their father or, or parental figure is doing work just to get them out the door every day right? and they are they are benefiting from that work and yeah. previously they hadn't even thought of that as work they maybe just thought about it as a responsibility of their dad right or an older sibling or something when we just use those familiar fami uh, what is it familial or like family uh, relationships as a way to mask the actual work 
mm-hmm. like goes into it, right? So it's like, oh, it's my mom. So it's my mom has to do it. Oh, it's my dad. My dad has to do it. Well, mm-hmm. he doesn't have to do it. Mm-hmm. You can get your own darn cereal, right? <laughs> like you don't, you don't have to have someone do it for you. But there's all these ways in which we cover up that work for ourselves in the society, mm-hmm. right? Um, and family obligations, gendered family obligations is one of them, right? Um, so I, I think I always have a lot of fun with that. And of course, like the first thing I think for my class, my labor class, which I think I, I love how you said it's like about robots and witches, because I think uh, right now it's called, what is it called? Uh, anthropology of work. Or labor. Yeah, one of those. <laughs> I think I'm going to rename it to robots, witches and gardeners. <laughs> A, it'll get me more students. But B, I think it's like, wait. You know, the students will read the description, they'll realize that this kind of a, they won't understand how to think about robots and witches in relationship to work. Mm-hmm. You might think about gardeners, right, more easily. But I think it's because the same thing, right, just like I like shaking up those high schoolers in terms of having them rethink what work is and how they benefit and consume all this work from those around them. Um, only gets hidden because of all these things we have society wise that hide them, right? Gender, race, and all these things that actually end up hiding that work. So the witch, the robot, I think is a really uh, interesting place where those logics sometimes become easier for us to grasp. Mm. Um, and then to think more deeply about what reproductive work is, what productive work is, right? The so called creative and useful work for for society but um so yeah reproductive work is always really uh really a fun topic for for the high schoolers and i think also for undergrads right because we have to like uh, uh, grapple with what it takes for us to be us every day right Mm -hmm. researchers and students alike yeah and so you know i i i do think that's a uh a really great kind of way to encapsulate the you know, labor analysis that we really focus on in our class, and yeah, it's 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 really I think empowering once you have these theoretical tools of you know understanding reproductive and productive labor um, to then see the world and and the the motions behind it, and also I I feel like you can start to pick apart certain systems, uh, broader systems that reproduce those kind of, uh, let's say, gendered conditions of, of right. reproductive and productive labor. And so here I actually um, would love if, if you could maybe, you know, dial in a bit on, uh, you know, the nuclear household and, you know, kind of giving my perspective to, 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 to give context, I feel like in a lot of ways, that kind of nuclear household structure does solidify these, uh, you know, let's say uh, certain labor hierarchies and certain labor, um, certain reproductive labor. Um, Because if you, for example, have a community that would take care of a child uh, and distribute the labor of taking care of the child through multiple chains of, you know, maybe uh, cousins, uh, com- general community members, like we do in certain mm-hmm. hunter gatherer societies, uh, then you don't have to put all this labor weight onto one specific individual and another specific individual. Right. Like if you were to distribute that, you wouldn't have the mother having to give all the effect, effective labor and all the physical labor. The same with the father, mm-hmm. all the effective and physical labor. I mean, that's that's kind of a standard that seems kind of impossible to many extents. Yeah, so we can think about it in terms of why that's the case, right? So uh, reproductive labor is produced as having little value or being devalued, right? And it's often gendered, right? So it like falls on women. And it's only a fiction that it has no value, right? Because actually it's at the core of uh, at the core of capital, right? The core of capitalism. So under capital, like you require people to produce work and produce goods 
and they're so-called productive. And then reproductive workers are the ones who are supposed to not supposedly don't produce things like commodities or, or things out to the market or creative things. But in actuality, we know that that is itself the foundation of 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 um of all labor relations, right? And so a lot of uh, particularly women of color have uh, levied interventions into uh, kind of the, the the more traditional right Marxist feminist way of thinking, productive versus reproductive, to help us think about how reproductive labor is itself um, foundational to all the relations of capital. Right, you don't have a worker unless you have forms of this so-called reproductive devalued work. Right? Mm -hmm. So we can think about it in terms of the family. We could think about how all these things get written as um, gendered reproductivity, right? So it comes naturally to certain bodies over others. Mm -hmm. And within a family, right, we can think of just a traditional racially unmarked heteronormative patriarchal family. The, 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 the mother is the one, right? Or an older sister, whoever is gendered as, as being female is the one who does the, the reproductive work of the family. But we know that the picture is also more complex, right? Because we know that in the case of, we can think, um, actually a really good example of it, there's an artist named Jalen Gomez who does um, a lot of really wonderful works around the kind of domestic economies, right? Uh, of race and gender. And so Jalen Gomez um, uh, kind of started doing their work by um, getting magazine cutouts from mainly like um, um, kind of like uh, um, like home decor magazines, I guess, or good living magazines kinds of things where they have like a lot of furnishing advertisements, mm -hmm. and they would paint into the these beautifully manicured scenes of like homes. They would paint in domestic workers mm. into these magazine ads, right? And there's one really beautiful one. It, there's a furniture company, home living company called, um, gosh, what is it called? Um, Bob, Bob Mitchell or something. Something, it's like two names, right? Um, it's like Bob plus like Mitchell or something. But he adds plus Maria. And <laughs> so it's all this beautiful furniture and he paints into the frame uh, a domestic worker. Uh, Damon does. And, and so I think um, there's a really kind of great way to be able to understand how there are racialized forms of work that also uphold the, the nuclear family, right? Mm -hmm. and we can think about it a lot in terms of uh, certainly more middle class and affluent families who then hire uh, primarily Latina workers. Mm -hmm. to do that work for their family, right? Either in the form of a live-in nanny or uh, live-out domestic workers or uh, house workers who, um, who do the work that then frees them up to do things that they want to do with their life, right? Including like taking care of kids, right? Mm -hmm. So they will take care of kids so the family has more time to focus on extracurricular activities or, or um, having date night. Or, but that's an entire both racialized and gendered economy of work that falls primarily on, on uh, historically black domestic workers, right, in the South. Um, and uh, on the East Coast, you have uh, um, Dominican and Haitian and, and, and a lot of uh, Puerto Rican, a lot of other um, Caribbean workers, Caribbean black and Afro Latinx workers. And on the West Coast, you have you know, increasingly Salvadorian, Guatemalan uh, uh, migrants from the south of Mexico, uh, and historically, right, Mexican Mexican migrants, and even more historically, Japanese, um, Japanese um, and Chinese domestic help, right, in California and places like San Francisco. So we do see that there there's a complex racial picture to economies of the home, right? Mm -hmm. That that is like, in addition to the kind of traditional nuclear family, right? They're in entire racialized regimes that uphold um, a status quo or a status of living for a lot of families, mm -hmm. and particularly South, um, Southern California.
Yeah, that reminds me of um, one of the articles you actually had us read, which was about um, the uh, domestic workers within Brazil. Uh, and there was a, um, there was like a photo of like these two um, white Brazilians um, going on to a protest on like i don't remember exactly what it was but like some kind of human rights or something like that mm -hmm. and they're you know uh, uh, and while they were walking in the background uh their baby children were being uh you know strolled with uh, by a you know black um you know woman uh, domestic worker mm -hmm. and it sparked this whole outrage about how like in brazil you know uh, these kind of uh, having a domestic worker that is racialized uh, comes to be a sort of marker of being in the middle class within Brazil. That's what the argument within that piece. And I feel like that is kind of is 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 a continuity of right. what you're talking about here with with the uh, racialized domestic labor and um, and that that. That, I think, is a great place to also just maybe if you could give us a broader picture of of all the ways in which kind of racialized labor happens in California specifically, especially you know, considering that like, what 90 percent of the agricultural workers right, in California yeah. are Latinx. And it's, it's a huge reality that is invisible to us. Yeah. Yeah, we saw this a lot right in the early um, like that first year of the COVID-19 pandemic where, where there were um, actually the LA Times just wrote this uh, really amazing piece. It, I, the title is something like um, Latino families lose their secret weapon, right? Uh, to success or like family life. I, I'm butchering the title, but the, it's like, you know, uh, the grandparents, right? So this idea that COVID-19 really hit Latinx families hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we know this is a case for the colleagues here in public health, like uh, Dr. Orlando Lebron, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Parker, and others, Dr. Sora Chanajasiri, and actually Dr. John Billamek as well in the School of Medicine, have really documented, right, that uh, in Orange County, it's the case that um, people who were hit the hardest were essential workers, right? And primarily the people working in the central uh, essential labor force in places like Orange County, but throughout the state of California are primarily Latinx, right? So in Orange County, by August um, of that first year of the pandemic, uh, Latinx communities were, are, were shown to have 1.8 fold higher incidence of, of COVID-19 infection. Like that's staggering, right? Yeah. And and a lot of studies, right, have have shown that there are a host of reasons, everything from essential workers to families living multi generational families, right? Like homes being multi generational families, um, and this is for a lot of reasons, right? Both to make ends meet, to have support for our families, right? Because we uh, Latino families tend to really center elders, right? Like our, our grandparents, and and so we. Uh, those things became reasons by which, you know, I think families are really largely impacted, right, by something like COVID-19. Um, so I, I think there's, uh, for a state like California, where Latinx populations make up so much of the critical labor force, um, uh, the state did really poorly by supporting them right in any kind of meaningful way and we can also see this again in in the context of orange county failing to support in a meaningful way uh, latinx communities and this is the orange county um uh health agency right who for example when uh the earliest of the vaccine distribution efforts happened they rightfully um, prioritize people 65 and older, right? Mm. But they did not take into consideration race, gender, class, or even essential worker status, mm -hmm. 
right? You would think that those would be crucial things to take into account, right? Because by that time, by the time that the vaccine rollout was happening, we knew that certain communities were more impacted than others, mm-hmm. right? Another example, um, one of the two super, what are they called, like super major distribution sites was at Soka University here in South County, which is in like a, a private, beautiful campus, beautiful university, um, but it's private and gated. It's difficult for me to get to. Right, like out of curiosity, I really wanted to see where it was, and I was like, "Oh my!" And I know South Orange County because I worked so much of it, right? As like residential gardener and fire mitigation worker. But I was still like, "Oh, that's right! It's like tucked back here." Who the hell is that serving? Mm-hmm. Right, for people who don't know, South County and Orange County is primarily affluent white. It's shifting towards kind of like Asian, but um, historically very white. Right? Um, and, and certainly in that area, you have um, more affluent, more educated, more, right? All those kind of like social economic determinants. Um, and the other one was in Disneyland, North King. But I mean, there's, there's all, you know, one of the things we could think about is Anaheim is, is um, uh, uh, well, maybe I don't need to get into <laughs> But I was just going to say that there, there are a lot of um, policing, right? The targeting of black and brown people by, by Anaheim police. Um, so there's reasons why people might not want to go to Anaheim. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, a really deep history of like white supremacy in, in Anaheim as well. Historically, Gustavo Arellano, uh, a writer for the LA Times now, but he wrote for um, uh, OC Weekly for a very long time. And, and has multiple books that he's written about and the higher and, and um, uh, kind of like the history of white supremacy in the region. Um, and then the other thing, right, the last thing I mentioned, when the vaccine rolled out, there you could like get an app, mm. right, to go ahead and register. Well, it was an English only app for weeks. Mm. So if you weren't English dominant, you could you literally could not sign up for the vaccine. Using that app. Those are failures. Yeah. Right? Those are complete and utter failures. Um, so that, that's a concrete moment where, like, people in North Orange County who are the service sector, the service sector part of the county, were let, you know, what, what is the expression? I sound like Ricky Ricardo from I Love Lucy. I always get my expressions like mixed with other ones are just completely wrong. But they were let out to dry, <laughs> let out to hang. I don't know what the expression is. Um, you know, I, so, so a lot of what I write about is this kind of, um, you know, concept that scholars like Nefertiti Tadiar, um, uh, Melissa Wright and others have written about uh, term disposability, right? Mm-hmm. Where um, even though these workers were essential Right. For us, for our everyday stuff, when we were at stay at home, they were working at the CVSs, the grocers, right? All these different places where their essential services were needed for us. Um, and yet they were the ones who were most at risk, right? Instead of being most protected, they were most at risk. So um, you begin to wonder, you know, what, what the value we place on certain lives actually is right? like what what that value is and and um and if there aren't moments like in orange county right with a whole vaccine distribution in which certain lives are not seen as worthy of protecting right um uh, so yeah i think it it also really goes this kind of concept of disposability that you mentioned i think it really is intertwined with the concept of invisibility and right um, all of this, uh, this, this kind of debacle of, of, of COVID-19 and, and leaving these vulnerable communities dry, that is, I think, very much related to how, I guess, our culture, in a lot of ways, it has to 
and it likes to obscure the uh, inequalities between kind of or, or among racial and class and gendered lines uh, and that's kind of how you know racialized capitalism is, is maintained um, and so I feel like the the, the, the COVID-19 vaccine giving uh, the, the the kind of uh, uh, the distribution that wasn't focused on right. uh, these these inequalities may be just stemming to that cultural ethos of oh you know we're a colorblind society and uh, you know especially here in California the, this kind of you know uh, Langan Winner talks about like you know cyber libertarians where they kind of um, you know in in the Silicon Valley esque areas. I've seen that a lot of people like, you know, Elon Musk or other billionaires or followers of them, they do have this colorblind mentality of, you know, let's not talk about racial issues. Well, let's just make, you know, the technology will, will determine our future. It will fix all right. of our problems, things like that. And so I think this also relates into our discussion of, um, you know, how robots kind of um, are, are related to labor and how it's not actually automated labor there's that that human component behind it so if you could talk yeah. a little about that yeah um there's a scholar there's a journalist on our campus um and i hope they'll forgive me because i can't remember her name at the moment but they uh they wrote an article for the atlantic two years ago maybe oh my gosh what is her name but they wrote this article for the Atlantic. I'm sure you just look up the Atlantic and you look up, you type in like Amazon and then like Riverside, it'll mm -hmm. pop up. But it was this really amazing piece about how Amazon has set up in the Inland Empire, right? As like a mass distribution site and packing. And, you know, there's all these stories of people who are worked to extreme conditions by Amazon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the fact in the, uh, in the packaging and, and, and uh, distribution sites. And so they've really set up shop, right, in the Inland Empire. Um, and of course, we have this idea um, that it's like everything is automated. You go on Amazon and you say, hey, I want to subscribe to this whatever thing. Send me coffee in my case. I want to subscribe to this coffee. It'll save five bucks, right? Mm -hmm. And then every month, they'll just ship me my coffee. And it's like magic, right? Yeah. Uh, side note, there's there's a graphic novel called, um, oh my gosh, why do I mention things in that? I don't know their name. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, it's, it's called something like uh, Nice House on the Lake. I think it is, but it's like this whole, it was written as a result of those first couple like cooped up months during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's um, this kind of space entity who befriends a lot of people throughout his life. And then selects people that he wants to live in this little nice house on a lake. Hmm. And um, he has him living in this house. And he says, don't worry. Um, uh, you now know that I've been creating this experiment. And everything you need, just put on this magic list. And it will arrive to you. And it's really kind of how we were living at that time. Yeah. We were all at home. We were ordering stuff. And it would just arrive magically. As if though there weren't people delivering it. There weren't people putting themselves at risk to get those things to us, right? So it's really a meditation on what it means today to actually have that kind of level of like um, opacity behind what it actually takes to get us what we need and our comforts. So in this piece on the Inland Empire, it talks about how there are all these people who get like subcontracted Right, they they are delivering packages, but they're using their own cars, right? And oftentimes, their cars can like break down, or they're they're uh, they're doing it because they absolutely need their income, and it's actually not providing them necessarily better living standards, but like pushing them into more precarious situations, and that's not something they can fully manage, right? Um, so I think there's. Uh, the reason why robots are really a lot of fun to think about is because people have thought about it for a long time, mm. right? Kind of like both the imagination that um, that ties automation and robots with uh, racial histories of servitude in the U.S., right, as being primarily marked as 
black, right? Because of slavery and servitude and, and the kinds of imaginations as a book we read in class by Flindy uh, Bora and Neda Bonasowski argue, right? That, that our kind of imaginations about uh, robots and automation are deeply ingrained with the kind of racial logics of the US that have always assigned servitude to, right? Uh, black and brown and, and, and um, Asian immigrants, right? Uh, historically. So that even though we may believe, right, that the kind of promise of automation, promise of robots, and, you know, we simplified as robots, is one where labor will be cut out of the process, right? Because it'll be in the hands of robots. They're making the argument that that's actually not true, right? Because the systems under which we produce these logics are so a part of moving forward, the kind of forms of capitalist exploitation, the kind of forms of as you mentioned earlier, racial capital that depend on um, our ideas of, of, of servitude, quite frankly, right, to, to make all this happen. So um, everything from the, uh, you know, the, the ways that companies like Amazon or Lyft or Uber are actively union busting, right, mm -hmm. to the kind of, uh, um, ideas that we have as consumers as these things arriving to us as if they'll magically, right? Including algorithms, right? Which require human work, often outsourced, right? To places like India um, and these little microtransactions as the authors highlight. But, um, you know, I, I think that's why the robot as a figure is a really, um, a kind of a really interesting place to go to to think about how race and labor are actually like within the context of the US and globally, right? Inseparable, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I, I hope, I, I think I will change the title of that class to Robots, <laughs> Witches, and Gardeners. Yeah. I think that kind of spe spectacularized form will uh, draw some more eyes. Yeah, I think so. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, the just to kind of add on on how you're talking about the kind of ideas of uh, what a robot would even look like, you know, in, let's say, science fiction or just a general cultural fantasy, how it is tied with with um, racialized systems, yeah, you know, right. we, we've seen um, how certain robots in the U.S. were modeled as you know and painted mm -hmm. you know with black skin uh, yeah. as, as 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 you know automata, but obviously they're reproducing certain um, ideas and uh, this using of other countries to fulfill the labor requirements of uh you know a, a nation state like the u.s with uh the workers in india being used to uh, work on algorithms or to go through you know um, facebook's uh, all those horrible images that right. you're never supposed to see um i think that deeply relates to a reality of of or intersects with the reality of neo-colonialism and i feel like when we consider the ways in which labor works across country boundaries we start to see how colonialism still exists you know you can think of latin america maybe um the the, the inpouring of, of immigrants from all the destructive um, you know, s civil wars and things like that, which were aided in a lot of ways by the U.S. military government um, to destabilize countries, put in dictatorships. You think of Pinochet or, or you know other um, individuals, especially in Central uh, Latin America. And so, do you do you see it? in different ways how kind of a, a, a colonial legacy and maybe a current neo-colonial reality intersects with all these concepts of labor that we've been talking about. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely, right? So um, things like forced migration, right, are, are an outcome of, of things. And, and we, um, one of, uh, I think one of the most important scholars uh, to have ever 
uh, he's emeritus now, but uh, Dr. Gil Gonzalez, who in the Department of Chicano Latino Studies for um, a long time wrote about these types of relationships, right? He had a number, a series of books that thought really deeply about, um, even within the case of the U.S. and Mexico, right? In his book um, that he co-wrote with Raul Fernandez, who is also emeritus here, but it's called, I think, A Hundred, A Century of Chicano History, I think is the title of it, but he outlines how um, uh, forms of Mexican migration into the U.S. are an outcome of U.S. interests going into Mexico, right, and particularly the border regions. Uh, everything from you know the U.S.-Mexico War to um, to like uh, railways setting up to extract silver and and copper, I, I think, from from the border regions. So um, these things have outcomes, right? At, at UC San Diego. Um, in the department that I got my PhD from, uh, the professor Yan Espiritu writes about um, Vietnamese refugees in the U.S., right? Uh, and, and this kind of um, a logic, right? Two logics. One of them, the we're only here because you were there, right? Like we're here as refugees because you were, right, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And how the U.S. has a so-called, like, we win even when we lose logic, right? So that mm. even though, uh, she argues, the U.S. had to retreat from the war in Vietnam, their ability to take on refugees was reframed as a way in which the U.S. could then claim to have been a kind of um, uh, benevolent power, right? Mm -hmm. And you see this with the Philippines as well. But, I mean, there are all these kind of uh, imperial legacies, right, of the U.S., um, so there, there's a lot of um, academics doing research on how those things, um, it's not as if though they just existed once and then there's no legacies from them, but to say that these historical events actually have after effects, right, mm -hmm. and, and uh, continue to extend forward in history, it's not like one and done, right, but that these things have long-lasting um, impact on people and forms of migration and, and uh, both forest and in terms of refugee communities and, and others. So, so I think, yes, there, there are definitely existing right, um, relationships there. Hmm. Yeah, and, and then maybe moving into kind of dialing, you know, back from the global, back into more of the, the localized areas. Um, we mentioned, uh, or we talked about already, you know, gendered labor within, um, you know, households. But maybe if you could expand for us the uh, on the dimensions of, let's say, uh, the labor of, of mothers, and maybe how that also relates to the whole concept of witches within your uh, class that we learned about and uh, Federici and mm -hmm. the, the the book she wrote of Calvin and the Witch. Yeah, I, um, in terms of, of I guess it's like the gendering of reproductive work. Um, we it's it's often the case, right, that um, uh, the way that we think of reproductive work is work of women, right? Uh, historically, it's how it's been produced, and for Federici, who writes about. Um, uh, kind of the, the um, feudal uprisings, right, of, of the Middle Ages, she points to the ways that um, uh, this was like a moment where capital begins its ascent, I guess, right, and it does so by doing two things, right, like um, taking lands that were previously considered the commons or available to everybody and begins to privatize those lands, right? And then um, it does another thing, which is to say it, it um, pulls women and their bodies into the relations of capital so that women um, who uh, were you know, um, central to their communities are now made into these uh, reproductive workers of uh, like their male counterparts, right? Um, and their work is absorbed into capital uh, in a way that devalues it, right, or expects it from them. Um, so then we get a series of things that end up ideologically um, 
uh, labeling all those women who didn't stick, to put it simply, right, stick with the plan that was given to them in order to uh, both privatize land and then absorb their work into the rise of capital, began to be labeled as uh, heretical, mm-hmm. right, or later witches, right? Um, and we see this happen both in, like, Puritan era, right, here in the U.S., uh, prior to the U.S., right? But, um, but we see how those things end up overlapping, right? That, that the, the category of the witch becomes a way to really be able to then demonize those people that they can't absorb, right? And, and then force into that system, or, like, terrify others into that system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think when it when it comes to this kind of enclosing of you know women's bodies i think that's such a powerful concept to really look at history um and you know this is why i kind of asked you know in in conjunction about you know mothers because i feel like the kind of reproductive labor that is done by mothers um in our societies today is is a result of 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 these histories of enclosing female bodies um and in terms of and it, it's, it's invisible to us as well as all the other reproductive labor and so when you would think about how for example mothers within the nuclear household are are, are put as as reproductive laborers how do you kind of understand that through a uh, lens of of kind of critical analysis of of race and class and gender. Do you feel like, for example, the fact that uh, families within minority populations, due to their material and economical qualities, um, have been more likely to experience uh, certain uh, fractures or certain, you know, uh, let's say uh, an absent father or um, some kind of uh, traumatic household history. Uh, how, how do you think that dynamic created by these economic inequalities uh, plays into the roles of uh, mothers and other kind of uh, reproductive labor within the household and maybe around the household? Yeah, well, I, I think um, a part of the, I guess a part of the challenge is, is thinking about um, uh, not necessarily how, you know, houses are broken up, right? Like, by, like this, although it's certainly the case, right? Like people like Cheryl Harris, I believe it, and others write about, um, uh, I believe it's Cheryl Harris, um, but writes about how there, there are various systems, right, that, that target, um, and actually people like Pia Kedaswami writes about how there are various systems that target, uh, particularly mothers of color, right, everything from uh, the, the kind of um, stripping of social safety net, right, mm-hmm. uh, like during the uh, Reagan era and after in the early 90s as well, um, that then create all these like legal loopholes for uh, mothers of color to have to prove that they are um, d- good mothers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but in actuality, all these programs end up creating all these limitations on how much um, uh, how much uh, access to services they can then get, right? There were like caps placed on uh, 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 when, uh, mothers on welfare. That they could only receive it for so many years before being cut off, which you know would end up making it so that a lot of uh, primarily women of color would have to go into the workforce, which itself is seen as antithetical to being a good mom, right, within our mm-hmm, society. Mm-hmm. So there are all these ways that women of color, primarily black women, are targeted as um, being forced to be the proper mom and going to make a living but then always failing to fulfill the figure of the proper mom because they have to work and therefore can't dedicate all this time to their children, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like a double standard that's enforced, again, as Priya Kandaswami notes, on, on primarily Latina and Black women, right, to 
both have to fulfill this dual role and, and to be set up to fail, right? And then have all these um, limitations placed on the resources they can tap into um, as, as um, head of households who need resources, right? Need more access to resources. Um, uh, so, so they're very concrete things, right? So I think an important thing is to um, uh, you know, note that not all these families are broken, but also that, that there's, um, uh, as you point out, like a need to complicate the figure of the mom is just being kind of like an unmarked, um, uh, kind of unmarked racially ambiguous, but to say that actually motherhood looks really different, right, for, for Latinas and, and Black women. Um, and certainly it's treated differently by the state, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting access to things. Um, yeah. You know, I, with all of these kind of um, labor conditions, uh, or well, before I maybe talk about that, um, just to add on, 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 on the, the reality of mothers, it's, it's also this kind of just like uh, I think a you know a student it's it's kind of seeing all that labor as as not a job right taking mm -hmm. care of your kids uh, you know feeding them giving effective labor um, or affective labor um, that's that's just kind of naturalized that's just made invisible normalized uh, and and so you see and i you know i i do see also there is a, a push for more and more mothers uh, to take on other jobs maybe you know become uh, digital entrepreneurs and this i'm talking about you know uh, not only kind of uh, mothers of of racial minorities but also like uh, you know i've seen certain aspects or, or subcultures of of white kind of motherhood uh, creating, let's say, entrepreneurial digital um, kind of YouTube movements, right? Or or selling certain project pro products through you know different pyramid schemes. It's kind of uh, capitalism trying to really extract as much labor as possible, and that that kind of then butts heads with this uh, idealized vision of of motherhood. Um, but I, you know, with all these kind of labor conditions that we've been talking about, like it's these are the these conditions produce real material consequences affecting you know uh, people in an extremely kind of harmful way, and I I feel like you know if theory isn't put under that context that. Uh, if we don't kind of return back to see how, for example, the uh, Latinx immigrants working domestic jobs or, 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 you know, agricultural jobs, how they have to live in, in you know, housing conditions that are terribly inadequate and have to deal with the exposure to certain chemicals, be it, uh, you know, let's say Roundup or even beforehand, way before where there were different gasoline showers and things like that. Uh, it, it, is, it is deeply upsetting. And, you know, especially as a student, like I, I go around, and I see all of this uh, reproductive labor happening now. And like you said, you can't, mm -hmm. once you see it, you can't unsee it. And, but I, I see it and I struggle with like, what do I do? What, I know these people are living in conditions of, of suffering and inequality, but how do you kind of deal with that? And so as a, as a you know, you, your job is in most of, in essence, a knowledge worker. Um, although, do you have any kind of ideas of how to uh, put that knowledge into a proactive strategy to maybe ameliorate inequalities and, and, and deal with these uh, gendered and racialized hierarchies? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, well, one of the challenges is, um, you know, I think I, one of the things I, I always want my students to know is like, 
um, people live their lives, right? Like people live their lives and, and can live them well and can be happy. Um, and so it's, it's like, it's like, I think about my own experiences, right? Where, um, you know, I grew up working with my dad and sure, you know, I, part, part of my early life was undocumented and, and we didn't have a lot, but like we weren't, it's hard to explain. Like we weren't suffering. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. um, uh, things were hard. We had people living with us, right, to make ends meet. Um, but like my childhood was a very happy childhood. Like there, there's cer certainly a lot of inequality, right, that we experienced as like undocumented and all this. Um, I saw my dad go through wage theft, right, as a child when, when I was a kid. And so a lot of these things uh, I do acknowledge, right, that um, like this large systemic racial inequality. Um, but you know it it uh one of the things is is to think about how um people are working with dignity right and we can ally ourselves with people so that they can have um jobs like for domestic workers right jobs that have dignity right and that they deserve it and that um they get paid well and that they don't get subjected to wage theft right so all this to say like it's um it's important for people to acknowledge that um, sometimes the answers aren't easy, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not that there's just like a lot of people. Um, how do we put it? It's uh, sometimes just knowing the conditions that structure people's work is like really, really important, right? Mm -hmm. Really crucial. Um, and as students, it's imperative that we understand that, right? Um, because then we can start to form forms of allyship with people and then support them, right? In, in terms of, of their job. If, uh, um, uh, to ensure that we can at least acknowledge them on campus and to maybe in some future, if there is, um, you know, a, a kind of... Uh, any kind of like uh, labor dispute or anything like that, we can be on the right side, right? We can we can be there to support our service workers, custodians, and other and others who deserve a uh, living wage, who deserve to be treated well, who deserve to be acknowledged. Um, and you know, I say that a lot from having lived through that experience, right? Of of coming from a family, the mom who worked, um, you know as a domestic worker, often uh, going to go and joining my dad, when my dad would, excuse me, landscape homes, she would come along with him and then, you know, clean the inside of home. So it's like, I, I have that legacy that I come from and, and I like really, I guess like protective of it, right? In the sense of like, I want people to to see it and I want people to acknowledge it and I want people to take classes in it and I want people to be able to think critically, right? About, um, about what it means in terms of their own lives and how we're all kind of complicit, right? And in, in, in this, um, um, but that doesn't mean that we then say, well, we can't do anything. Therefore we don't have the responsibility to think about it. It's like, actually it's the opposite. We have a responsibility to think about it and to, um, uh, at least do that initial um, kind of self-reflection about what it takes for us to actually be who we are in, in, in this university setting and beyond, right? Um, so I think that's always really crucial to me, that students see that, right? That they can think about it deeply so then they can live the rest of their lives or at least that, uh, like a level of clarity. Right, as to um, uh, who these workers are and um, what it takes uh, to have our society actually run, right? And you're right, it's not, it's very difficult for a lot of people, like farm workers, like people who um, are experiencing forms of wage theft, right? Like the, it's for day laborers and others, they have little protection, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, the more we know, the, the more likely we are to become involved, the more likely we are to be mindful about it in our future careers, right? And, and the way we 
act towards others. Right? Yeah. Do you think the education of um, the distribution of education to the people living in uh, certain unequal labor conditions is also important to um, changing society? I've, you know, from a kind of to also give context, I've. I've noticed that um, for certain individuals, like for example, you know, um, certain mothers that I've uh, encountered throughout my life, they also have been fed an ideology where what they do is not really labor, the, all their child work and, uh, you know, the cooking for the houses, house and the family, they, Many of them are led to believe that that's not even not even a, a, a an inequality, and so I'm wondering. First of all, do you think that there is this issue of swaths of uh, uh, labor under unequal conditions being unaware of certain exploitative systems affecting their lives, and if so, is one of the ways to combat that or ameliorate it? the distribution of education to them right well i i think that, that that one's a bit more complex right because there are a lot of people who um uh, who who may not want to think about it that way right and like that's totally okay right because mm -hmm. for them it might be well no, i love my children and this is what i do and it's not labor and uh it's like not our place you know what I'm saying? like it's not our place to overwrite that Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we can't that we can't think about it as yeah, it's a, you know it's a form of labor and people oftentimes have different relationships to the work that they're doing right so um, they don't necessarily need to view their their forms of affective and care work as um, labor right mm -hmm. like um, they can view it but of course we can we can think we can think about all the ways that those economies are built as being in part built by the way we think about our own relationships to others right and how it might mask certain things as work but um it's also to you know we should be capacious enough to to uh, know that many people think about the relation to things like child rearing differently right mm -hmm. um and then they might not be like yeah that is labor damn it uh pay me or so you get what i'm saying yeah. like so it's it's um it's different right it can be different for a lot of people and of course the circumstances can be quite different right in terms of mothering so it really i mean it really depends on um i guess how how people think about it but it's it's also you know i'm always worried of being more prescriptive it's prescriptive i think it's uh, about answers right or, and so i don't know much in terms of like how you would educate mothers right because that's not really um not really like a, a thing that i do right but like of course we can think about people like farm workers or or domestic workers and others where like modes of popular education have been used often right as a way to build critical mass towards some common goal right so <laughs> popular education to then be able to advocate for like labor rights. Um, popular education to be able to advocate against an employer of some sort, right? Like factory workers or farm workers. Um, so there, there are strategies that people use to better their lives, right? And it often comes in the form of popular education. Um, so, but I mean, those, those are, you know, I, I don't, um, I wouldn't really have a satisfactory answer in terms of like more atomized families and how people think of their labor, but certainly at the level of, of um, uh, economies like domestic work, farm work, day labor, res uh, residential landscaping, popular education has been really important for being able to then um, advocate right for some sort of like labor protection or labor rights for domestic workers, something like overtime pay. Right, or, um, or, uh, or, or forms of like work protection. Right? Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I love how you inject kind of nuance into that discussion and, um, you know, go, coming, you know, closer to the end of, of, of our chat here, 
Um, I, I have to ask, um, with the theoretical background that you uh, that, that that kind of you use to educate and understand the world, that being you know uh, certain critical uh, theory that stems from kind of Marxian analysis, how does the taboo, if at all, of kind of um, Marxist theory play within your experience within academia and maybe outside of academia? Um, well, within academia, I mean, it's, it's like I was trained in it, right? Like my field, um, a lot of scholars work with Marxist analysis, right? Certainly, if you're, if you're doing anything on the political economy or something like domestic work or gardening, then uh, one way to think about it is through Marxist analysis because it gives us a clearer way to think about how uh, our forms of labor are distributed, right, and taken on by certain groups. Um, so for me, it's more commit, like that's the methodological and theoretical armature of how I'm able to create my projects, right? It like gives me the glue and binding or the language by which to think critically about the topics that are important to me. Right. Um, other people might use something like psychoanalysis, right? And mm -hmm. but they, there are ton of people who do like Marxist analysis and psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, it just happens that like thinking political economy, thinking Marxist thought, right, um, in theory, um, is actually a really clear-eyed way to say this is how things are happening, and this is why this form of work is devalued, and this devaluation of work and people actually produces net benefits for others, right? And mm -hmm. this is how like, that value transfers, right? So for me, it's like a way to be able to speak to that. Like, I understand that the kind of popular understanding of Marxism as constantly being demonized in the U.S. because of, uh, again, right, the, the kind of long shadow of, like, Latin America under, like, um, left-leaning intellectuals from Castro to Che to uh, Salvador Allende and others, right, who um, Marxist thought is always, has been used as, um, or I should put this, how should I put it? Um, It's been used as a kind of scapegoat in some ways to right overthrow governments and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Right? Um, even like in the case of Salvador Allende, he was popularly elected into a democracy, but this idea that he was left-leaning Marxist intellectual then becomes uh, one of the reasons why, right? As you mentioned, really Pinochet, right, is put into place by the U.S. and others. Um, so. So I don't know, I'm, I'm doing my work, right? My work matters to me. It's the way that I'm able to think critically about my work. And for me, that's enough, right? Like for me, that's actually a whole lot. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how to help those other people, right? <laughs> <laughs> to get less scared or something like that. Because really, it's just, it's, it's a mode of analysis. Right? Yeah. But oftentimes it gets thought of as some sort of indoctrinating tool. And it's like, well, the, if the indoctrination is that you get to understand more clearly how our forms of economic exploitation function, then maybe that's a good thing. Unless, right, the system is actually benefiting you and mm -hmm. you don't want to see that, yeah. then it's an antithetical to what you might want to undertake, right? Um, yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, on that note. <laughs> yeah, no, this this kind of um, the the idea of indoctrinating it it all it does come back to this idea that you've mentioned, but that's a whole other discussion um, about you know how it's kind of uh, theory and and bias plays into understanding you know of what's objective and what's valid. Um, you know, this is a a thing in anthropology you can think of just sort of you know persons you mentioned yeah. in our class but uh you know if if you if you don't use a let's say the marxist analysis to understand the world well then you're automatically using another analysis which would be let's say i don't know 
classical economics, which comes from a history of, you know, neoliberalism. And that's, that's a way of analyzing the world. And uh, I'm thinking that that, you know, one way of understanding the world is, let's say, indoctrination, but the other one is just normal. It's right. just the common sense way of understanding things is, is, is kind of the same way that, you know, it's, it's the same mechanism of, of a, a dominant economic system obscuring reality like you know realities of labor yeah. um and so uh, you know i always love to kind of end on on a, a more personal note and so uh i i i would love to ask do you in your daily life or you know throughout the span of your life do you think of finitude and how does that play into how you view uh, your your being in the world and what actions you want to take within it. But as in, like, I'm going to die someday? Yeah, that, like mortality. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th- I don't know. I guess I think about it more now, right? Like, um, like I was once an undergrad like you, right? But mm-hmm. um, no, I think about it a ton. And uh, I actually really like that question. Um, I think about it a lot, not because of this, like, oh, I want to leave a legacy. Like, I don't, Mm -hmm. like, whatever, right? Like, that. I think about A, because I'm not terrified of dying. And then, as we (laughs) all should be. Um, But I think about it a lot because of, like, the people who aren't here anymore. Uh Right? So I, like, it's weird. I got, um, as soon as I got this tenure track job, right? Like, so I should should step back. Um, when you're a PhD student, you write about a topic, right? And, and you study, and then you like qualify, and then you begin research, and then you write the dissertation, and it takes you six, seven years. Right? That's like a long commitment to, to thinking about something. And so I finished my PhD, I wrote a dissertation, and, and you know, now it's in the process of becoming a book. <laughs> um, but I, what I can't make sense out of is like, okay, that's an expectation of a tenure, right? So you write that book as being written. But what I can't make sense out of is why, since I started, you know, my tenure track job here at UC Irvine, I've written so much about loss. Hmm. Like I've written all these little pieces. Uh, some of them are out. Some of them are under review right now. But it's like of people who left such a lasting impression on me who aren't here anymore so like my dad and like uh, he was a cousin but not really a cousin he was kind of a father figure to me because my dad was constantly working when I was younger and he was one of I kind of like made mention a little bit to it but uh, earlier but he was one of the people who lived with us when we were trying to make you know ends meet and my mom would like cook meals for these workers who were like from our hometown but like you know one like this cousin lived in the garage and um yeah because we converted into like a little room and and, like i really love this guy right like he was just like everything to me um it was you know i was like for for the first period where he lived with us was maybe like nine he lived with us for like four years maybe then he uh went back to mexico for a couple years and then when i was a sophomore a junior in high school i remember because um my mom had told me that he was coming back to live with us for a bit. At this point, he was married and he had two kids. Um, but he was going to come over to save up money so that he could go ahead and bring his wife and, and two children to live, um, uh, you know, live with, not live with us, but like live in the U.S., right? Um, and so I remember my mom being like, oh, he's going to come. One of these days, he, you know, he's going to, because he, he got a pollero to cross him across the border. Poyero is a person to smell those people. So he, um, uh, so I remember going to school and just thinking, is today the day it's going to show up? But I was so nervous because I hadn't seen them since I was like a kid. And now I was like a junior in high school. So yeah, I don't write about this. This is just a story, right? But um, and so, you know, we'd go to school and I'd come home and he wasn't there. Go to school and come home and he wasn't there. And then one day when the school came back, he was sitting, there's a thing we call cajete. A cajete is kind of like a raised area around a tree. 
right? It's like they keep the water in it. But my dad had built kind of a couple bricks tall cajete around a big ficus tree in, in our live in, in our house, in my mom's house. And then I come home from school one day and he's sitting there in the, on the cajete. And he had like red hair and he had green eyes. Um, and I just remember seeing because it's such an anomaly in some ways, right? Maybe not so much in the region that I'm from in, in Mexico. There are people who have red hair and green eyes, but um, he was striking, right? Like to me, he was such a striking person. And I remember coming home and I had my tennis racket across my chest. And I was like overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do, right? But um, he lived with us for like two years. And then he lived for maybe another three years uh, because he was a gardener at a um, golf course in San Clemente. And due to employer negligence, he ended up dying from the job. Mm. And so I just wrote this one piece about him, like a small, it's actually like a kind of a coda or an afterthought to a larger piece about. Um, the kinds of vulnerabilities gardeners face at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I end with him, and I end with this story where when he was still alive, um, that that second time that he was living with us, on the weekends, um, my dad had a house that he would do maintenance for. And um, on Saturdays, he said, well, we would call him Lolo. Lolo, you can, he told him, you can go ahead and do that house and a couple others. Um, and like, you know, Elias, the, the everyone, my family calls me Elias by my middle name, not, not some of them. And Elias will go with you or, you know, my brother will go with him. So for a while we spent doing maintenance of a couple of homes on Saturdays. And there was one time, it was this, it's an older white woman who lived on Beach Boulevard, kind of by Knott's Berry Farm. Um, she lived in a beautiful craftsman house now, like I understand what that is, but like it was this really beautiful old house. She lived by herself and beautiful backyard. And there was like this rose bush, and I was trimming the rose bush. And Lolo had the, the lawnmower, and she had like this great big grass. And Lolo would um, do like a swirl pattern with it because it ended at a tree in the middle of the lawn. Mm. So it would look really cool, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a creative type, I guess. So he would do this beautiful swirl around it. And I remember um, I'm trimming the bush and some of the thorns cut my palm and I'm like grabbing my palm um, and I cut it pretty deep because I had like a good a fair amount of blood on my hand. And I guess Lolo saw from whatever distance he was and he turned off the machine and he said, like, what? what's going on here? And he comes over and although the machine is off, he doesn't say a word. He just grabs a couple of rose petals, puts them on my hand where the cut was, puts his hand over it, then he gets my other hand and puts it right where his hand was, and he just did that, like, just keep it there. He didn't say anything, so like, keep it there. Um, and then the rose petal acted kind of like what Mexican, what my Mexican family does. When you get a cut, they put an onion skin yeah. on it to act as a temporary scalp but it kind of did that and that's like one of the last it's not the last memory i have with him but it's one of the last and it's certainly the most impactful but like that's what i'm thinking about the finiteness right that he we, one could say he's not here but is he right like to me he is right in this other way um i'm writing about him and i'm thinking about him and um he's kind of given me this gift right uh, since i was a kid um and so i don't know i guess i'm thinking about it a lot and it surprises me right but but sometimes we just carry people with us uh, and that's like beyond any kind of like are they here or aren't they here right? yeah that's honestly a really beautiful story and a beautiful image um it is interesting how you know, people in history itself really, you know, we carry it every day and yeah. uh, throughout our lives. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, it kind of, uh, I guess, 
sometimes related question, but not necessarily. Where do you find the meaning within your daily life? Like, what really keeps you motivated to keep going amidst all the you know complexities and 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 um, struggles that life may bring? I don't know. Right now, it's just kind of. Uh... It's a lot of, it's never just one thing, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes they're really silly, unsatisfactory answers. Like, I guess I told you earlier, like playing video games. Like, I love the, <laughs> like, super shallow answer. But I love playing video games. And, like, um, I, like, I mean, again, it's those small things, right? Like, I've had a pretty big comic book collection. Because as a kid, I would always buy comics. So I had, like, Pretty pretty good comic collection. I still have some of my like gems, right? Like comics that are now quite valuable and, and valuable to me personally, right? But like I wouldn't sell those, but I sold a bunch of my comics. And I did it so that I could then because I was like, they're in a box. And I know they're there and that's really cool. But I'm not reading them. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's that kind of sucks, right? So what I ended up doing was I sold a, a, a lot of them, probably like 90% of my collection. Uh, which again, since they weren't in great condition, it's like if I was a kid and I would read them. Um, but what I did is I ended up buying, now they do all these like omnibuses and collections. So I just sold a bunch of my stuff and I started buying those collections to encourage me to put them on the shelf and actually read them. Cause like that'll bring me joy instead of just amassing these old comics. And I thought it was more important for me to, like, let go of these comics and then be able to enjoy the ability to have them there for me to read. Maybe someday my kid wants to read them, I don't know, but um, just stuff like that, like spending time with my kid, too. Like, I come from a very family-centric kind of upbringing, so I um, kind of like spending time with my kid and, um, I don't know, just a lot of normal stuff, I guess. I, I can't watch much TV or movies because I don't have the time to do that quite right now. But um, I somehow will always find a way to play video games. Like mainly because I put it on my computer. Uh, so when I'm taking breaks from work, I can just like pop up. Uh, like I emulate a lot of Super Nintendo games. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do that. Um, but yeah, just normal, normal stuff like that. Yeah. That's also actually really beautiful because it's focusing on those little small things, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, like you said, you don't have to always have this kind of grand, you know, vision of you know leaving a legacy right, or something yeah. like that. Um, within uh, kind of uh, like, would you consider your children and you know comic books and video games as as kind of um, wells of, of strength that you draw on? And do you find other wells of strength within your life? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, well, the short answer is, yeah, right? Like, uh, um, I think I shared the piece where I talk about, doc, you know, it's like about fire, weed abatement work, like fire mitigation work. Um, it's like this piece that I wrote for UCHRI, which is like a UC Humanities Research Institute. But um, it's like my experiences growing up and like the hillsides of Orange County, doing this like clearing of old brush and stuff to protect homes from fire risk. But you know, I'm telling this story in relationship to Doctor Strange, <laughs> right? Um, uh, the, like the experience of like reading Doctor Strange comics on can like on top of canyons in Orange County, right? Along with like a lot of like migrant workers who work for my dad's company. Um and so yeah, I, I mean the, the simple answer is like I like comics. The more complex answer is like memories of comic books are tethered to like other things, right? Like growing up working is uh, one of them, right? Um, growing up working alongside, um, you know, migrant Latino workers is another thing. Telling them the stories that I was reading in the comics. Like, that's another thing, right? Like, so it's not just about comics. It's about, like, 
these material things, like Professor Ian Strong says here, a colleague of mine in anthropology, like material culture has like a really significant, um, meaningful, this, right? He does this excellent, excellent class on like where he has students use Legos to retreat or to create some sort of society, <laughs> like lay leftover Lego pieces that they find uh, here on campus. And this like project that he has called the IDUCI or something. And it's like those dilapidated buildings by the gym where students dig up and they find all these Lego pieces because there used to be a, a, like a children's school there. And I guess the kids like over whatever number of decades, one or two or something, like would lose Lego pieces and now the undergrads at our school are digging and looking for stuff like material culture and they find like arms and like little hats and all this stuff and so he has this class like use that stuff to recreate or create things um, so I think uh, sometimes the things we surround ourselves with tether us in very real ways to how we experience or um, comic books and video games is like one of those things right like uh, I'll end with this, but like I played a lot of video games. I think because like growing up undocumented, it was like the. I swear to God, I'm probably being super cynical reading too much into this, but I swear my mom was like, video games are okay because they're indoors and they're inside and they're safe. Mm. Right? If they're inside playing video games, that means they're not outside, right? And they can't get picked up um, by the cops or something, right? So. Like innocuous and offensive, right? Uh, video games, but like the deeper part of that is, I think I like them because of growing up undocumented, right? So I don't know. <laughs> Not simple answers, but I think um, we don't we don't experience life simply, right? Uh, there's always a lot of meaning that we make behind any little practice, right? Oh, that's that's really interesting. You know, thank you so much, yeah, Sal, of course, for taking yeah. this time and, and talking with me. This has been a really amazing conversation, and um, I hope the listeners will really draw as much as they can from your knowledge and expertise. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you.